here we go. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Raymond and I am the director of Archer Gallery and Clark Art Talks here at Clark College. Um, thanks again to Terry Powers for joining us today. And uh, thank you to um, all of our students, uh, faculty, Clark College community, et cetera, that are here uh, joining us as well. It's super nice to see you all. Um, so um, just before we get into lecture, a few notes. Um, I wanted to say a few things about Archer Gallery and Clark Art Talks programming. Um, Archer Gallery currently has a stunning show up right now in our physical gallery space on our campus at Clark College. Uh, the show is titled Of a Setting Sun, and it is a two-person exhibition by artists Anna Fiddler and Katie Stone. Uh, the show is up through March 11th um, and viewable by appointment. Uh, please email me if you're interested in checking it out on campus. Um, my email is mraymond at clark.edu. Um, and I have a few slots left over the next few weeks. So uh, do get in touch with me um, if you wanna check that out. Uh, we will also be having an in-person closing reception on Friday, March 11th um, from six to 8 p.m. And that'll be our first uh, uh, in-person reception or event of any sort related to Archer Gallery and Clark Art Talks since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so uh, that should be really exciting and really fun to just have everybody in that space again and to be able to kind of celebrate uh, the work uh, together in person. So really cool. Um, and uh, you do have to, uh, because space is limited due to COVID protocols, you do have to get a, um, an Eventbrite ticket. It's free, um, but it is through our website. There's a link for it on there. So archergallery.space, you can go there and get a free ticket um, and come to that uh, closing reception for the show. All right, um, and uh, today, this is our last Clark Art Talk of uh, the winter term. We will continue to have um, virtual Clark Art Talks through the spring term. Uh, we'll see T TBD in terms of next year. Um, we'll probably do some form of hybrid, uh, virtual and in-person. Um, it's so nice to uh, have the accessibility and to be able to bring in artists from all over the country to talk with our Clark College community. So we'll probably keep some virtual components next year and also um, some in-person as well. Um, but going into spring, uh, we will continue to have virtual talks. So um, those artists are still kind of being worked out. Um, but if you keep checking back on our website again, archergallery.space, Archer um, you can go there and um, see what uh, we have in store for you for spring term. Um, and with that, I'd like to move into some thank yous. Um, thank you again to Terry Powers for being here. Thank you to Lisa Conway, who is always here and a fantastic supporter of our programming. Um, thank you to, uh, again, our students and community for being here. Um, and finally to um, ASCC, um, who is our student government at Clark College for the funding and support that you give us for our programming. Uh, we would not be able to do this without you, so thank you. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce today's fantastic lecturer, Terry Powers. Um, I first heard of Terry and his work almost a decade ago now uh, when I was living in San Francisco. He was in grad school at Stanford around the same time I was in grad school at the San Francisco Art Institute. Uh, there were conversations around the beauty of his craft, the application of the paint, the compositions, the color usage. Uh, there was a small group of us in the Bay working in realism at the time, and we kind of stuck together. So I knew it was important to keep track of Terry's work. Over the years, I've been able to do this on and off through his galleries and most recently through Instagram. Uh, what a complicated thing social media is, but there are some really lovely parts of it, like keeping people and their work connected. The past couple of years, I've continued to keep tabs on Terry's work and his paintings, um, and they are as luscious as ever. The paint is juicy and fresh, almost delicious. Uh, one of my favorite attributes of paintings is their tasty quality. Uh, Terry weaves in and out of genres from still life to figurative to landscape and back again, portraying his subjects with intense care and affection. He paints the everyday experiences he has from life, from observation. He looks and sees and responds through his expert understanding of color as visual language. A storyteller, it seems by nature, he depicts his surroundings and then often adds a bit of context in the form of written or painted text. These pieces stand out in particular as they appear to reference even comic books um, or even Instagram posts. A contemporary take on the everyday and on the seemingly banal moments that we all experience in our daily lives. 
Terry received his BFA from Rhode Island School of Design and his MFA from Stanford University. He currently lives and works in Logan, Utah, where he's joining us today. And he is an assistant professor of painting and drawing at Utah State University. Please help me welcome renowned painter, Terry Powers. Hey everybody, let me uh, get this screen share going real quick. Uh, And again, if uh, folks wanna use the chat to ask questions throughout, I'll um, moderate and um, yeah. Can everyone see this okay? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. Great. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, thanks, Michelle. That was a really great intro, way better than I could have done. I had a short intro for myself here, but yours is way better. So I'm gonna skip that part <laughs> of mine. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, of course. I was going to complain about how cold Utah winters are at the beginning of my talk, but then I was just told five minutes ago that it's been snowing in Portland too. So, uh, you know, I don't know, I guess it's snowing everywhere. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm currently living in, in, in Utah. I got a job here at the university in Logan. Um, I had a child, our second child, about a week before we moved here six months ago. Uh, it's been the most chaotic six months of my life. I still walk around lost and confused most of my days. But um, today I'm going to talk about paintings, the things that make me feel most comfortable, honestly. So um, I'm going to get to that here in a minute because I don't have a ton of time. I grew up uh, just south of San Francisco in a town called Menlo Park, uh, which is most famous now for where Facebook is, which is not something I normally brag about. And I'm not doing that here. Uh, and I think that has something to do with the paintings that I'm making. I'm not totally sure how, but the Bay Area was always a really important part of, uh, of the work that I had been making. Um, like uh, Michelle said, I went to RISD and majored in painting there, and then I went to Stanford after that. Um, I taught for a long time at SFAI, uh, off and on at Stanford, and at the last few years at San Jose State before moving here. Anyway, uh, my talk today is broken up into two sections. Both are about observational painting, which is what I'm most excited to talk about. Uh, the first section is kind of how I came to it because it's kind of this long and windy road. So kind of this narrative path about how observational painting became a big part of my life. And the second part is a more specific project that I've been working on, uh, which is these paintings on paper that I showed last summer at Dolby Chadwick Gallery in San Francisco. So anyway, so I'm gonna jump right into it. Uh, I paint pictures directly from observation using oil paint. I don't use any real interme intermediary tools like photographs or I don't use Photoshop or anything like that. Um, no internet images, stuff like that. I don't really like to set things up too much either. And I, I don't add anything into the composition or really I try not to take anything out. I, my, my main focus in painting still for, the last, for about the last 10 years is to just try to focus on what's in front of me. And I started to paint this way about eight years ago, right after I graduated uh, from grad school. Um, I had gone on this graduate fellowship in Paris for five months and it was amazing. And I was with my girlfriend, who's my wife at the time and neither one of us had ever really left the country. So we were really excited about it. I had this studio right in the middle of the city like kind of near the Louvre and I'm really romantic about painting. So it was kind of like an exciting thing like all these painters that I'd loved kind of painted all <laughs> in that area. And so for the first few months I was there, I had just been making the same paintings that I had been making in grad school, kind of feeling like I was on a treadmill a little bit. Um, here's some grad school paintings, as you can see, there are these very large, uh, uh, you know, I guess pretty realistic articulate uh, style paintings. Here's another one here. Um, this is when I made this painting when I was really frustrated <laughs> with painting as we all get sometimes. So anyway, so, you know, these, you know, I'm using Photoshop quite a bit to make this work and, and um, just these really contrived kind of like hyper set up scenes. So I'd been making that also in Paris, but I started to realize that it felt really odd that I was halfway across the country uh, and my work looked exactly the same as it did back in, in, in Palo Alto. So I, I decided to make this really big painting of the actual studio. This is a, a picture of the Paris studio that I was living in. Uh, directly from observation, just because I wanted an account of this experience that could only be made in Paris. And it didn't produce the greatest painting that I'd ever made before, but I, I wasn't that concerned about that. I was so thrilled by the experience of just making it. And I felt so engaged with the actual process of painting. And I th think it felt real and sincere in a way that painting hadn't felt uh, in a long time to me. Um, and I think a lot of those paintings that I just showed from grad school, uh, 
though they were maybe kind of like, you know, perhaps intellectually interesting to me or some people at the time, uh, always felt a little bit contrived to me. So anyway, so I like this painting that I made because it reflected my experience in the world. And actually like, I had no plan to get this painting back. So I just left it on the wall in the studio when we had to leave because I didn't have any money to ship it home. So it's just, I don't know, they, the janitor probably threw it out or it's just floating around in Paris somewhere. I don't really know. Um, so when I got back to San Francisco, I decided to kind of do the same thing. And I started painting my studio because that's where I wanted to start. Uh, and it kind of felt like, uncharted territory for me. I was still working out the process of painting these and I hadn't really done all that much um, observational painting at this time, even though, you know, going to RISD, the, I feel like the reputation of RISD was always like it was this more like traditional style art school as composed to some, something like Cal Arts, which is a little bit more like avant-garde RISD. I think people want to go there because they're going to learn this kind of like technical craft. And in some cases that was true, but really like, I think most of my professors at that time, it was the late 90s, early 2000s, were artists that came out of the 60s. So they were, you know, really abstract painters from that era and didn't have much, con weren't that interested in represent representational painting. And I really always have been. So if you're going to do that, you're always gonna just paint from the photograph anyway. And we weren't really like questioning that too much. Like Luke Toyman's kind of started getting popular, but like no one's really questioning that yet. And so you could just kind of do that. I think it's a little bit different now. Um, so I'd never really learned to paint from observation. And what I realized is that it was really difficult uh, really difficult because there was no safety net to it. There's nothing to fall back on. All you really had was your vision, really. You know, it's, it's one thing to kind of look at a photo and translate a photo, which is already sort of broken down into two dimensions, and then translate that onto a two-dimensional surface, which is fine. A million fascinating, brilliant things can be made that way. Uh, but I think when looking at something and all the uh, subtle nuances of value and color, it's, it's so overwhelming that you need to learn how to kind of summarize what you see in a way and to develop some kind of method to reflect what you see in front of you. And whatever method that may be, however you decide to summarize it, essentially um, sort of dictates the way your paintings are going to look. And so that's what I'm kind of starting to do here. I think also when a lot of people think of observational painting, they think of plain air painting or, some, painting or something, which is fine. I, I love the genres, you know, landscapes and flowers and skulls or whatever. Uh, but I also started to get excited about things like computer, uh, like computers or space heaters or things like that, just kind of like trash and garbage around me that I thought could be like also sort of interesting subject matter to paint. And at that time, you know, I wasn't seeing it as much. I mean, this is, you have to remember, kind of pre-Instagram. And so like, you know, I wasn't, didn't have as much access to things, but, um, you know, now you see everything out there in the world. But at the time, it sort of felt exciting to me. Anyway, um, Here's that same palette that was in this previous painting that's kind of horizontal. Here it is kind of leaning against the wall. I think what uh, most people do when they're deciding what to paint or make any kind of artwork is to, is to uh, display what they find valuable. You know, it's kind of like pointing at something and hope that other people maybe find value in it too. I watch my nine month old do this all the time. He just learned how to point at things and he gets really excited when other people look in that direction because it's like this new kind of found power that he has. My previous son did the same thing. So I was kind of like waiting for it, but it's really fun to watch. And then, you know, maybe that, maybe that desire just doesn't change even as we get older, I'm not sure. So anyway, in this painting, I'm trying to keep everything life-size. This painting is really big. It's like, it was about a hundred, I'm sorry. I'm, just I'm talking about the previous painting. This painting was like about a hundred inches squared. And I'm, I'm really trying to keep everything life-size. And I'm really just trying to learn how I want paintings um, to look, painting from observation. So jumping forward a few years, we have our first child, and I don't know anyone out there who's had children before, but it definitely changes your daily routine. And so until like up to this point, I'm kind of like, I can pretty much paint whenever, if I'm not in class, I can paint. Um, but then uh, when you have a kid, it's all of a sudden your schedule really gets crazy. So I had to move out of my studio because I wanted to be home more with the baby. Um, and we lived in this apartment on Haight Street in San Francisco that was like the size of a gas station bathroom. So it was like so small, it was like 500 square feet. So I didn't want to paint inside too much because of the fumes and all this stuff. Um, uh, and, and anyway, so this is like a painting I made two days after we got home from the hospital. I only show it here because this is my wife, Melissa. And I like it. And I think it's funny because you can, she's so mad at me because I'm making her stand in the kitchen. And you know, it's, I don't know, artists are selfish, I guess. I just, I feel like I just, I just like one of those moments like, oh, I got to have this as a painting, you know? And everyone always thinks that I made the baby in this painting like way too small, which I totally get because the baby looks tiny in this painting. But our baby was three weeks premature. So he was like really, really little. 
Um, and Melissa was exhausted, of course. It wasn't like the easiest birth. Um, but anyway, I like this painting. And I actually put it in a show uh, not long after I made it. I don't know, I had too many things going on, but I was like, no one's gonna like, like who wants a painting of my angry wife and my tiny child, you know? And it was like the first painting that sold. So, and I'm really upset about that. I almost, that almost never happens. Like normally, whatever, I don't really care that much, but um, I really wish I still had this <laughs> painting, but it's just like this painting of me and Melissa just sitting in someone's living room somewhere. I don't know. Um, hey, Terry. And then, yeah. Um, one of my students asks, uh, is it difficult to draw someone from life without setting it up? Uh, did school help you with that? I'm sorry, you cut out for a minute. Is it difficult to draw someone from life? Yeah, from life without setting it up. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's always difficult. Yeah. I, what I'm going to talk about in a little bit is that um, I don't paint a lot of figures, even though I want to. In fact, most of the painters I, I look at are figure painters. Like, I really love figure painting. But I hate dealing with people's schedules. Like, people are just too unreliable. Like, if someone would just come to my house every day and paint, all I would do is paint them, you know? And I don't understand painters like Frank Auerbach or people like that who painted the figure like seven days a week, you know, and I have like dogged attention to it. I'm like, who are these models that you're finding that have nothing better to do than pose for you hours a day? But anyway, the answer is yes, I, if I think I understand the question, but it's hard painting figures when they're also set up as well. You know, to me, there's not, there's not that much of a difference, you know? Um, how how long did your, how, sorry, how long did your wife stand and pose for you for this? Oh, well, this painting is like, as you can see, it's 11 by 14. It's so I can long. get, generally what I do is like, I'll have her stand there. I draw it in really, really fast and I'll paint her first before I paint anything else. So she can like be done a little bit. Um, and then I can paint everything else when she's not standing there, but like an hour, um, I'm, I'm pretty quick, you know, and the painting is pretty loose too. You know, I think computer screen kind of like flattens things out a little bit, but it's like a pretty loose painting, you know? Thanks. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so yeah, so I'm not painting inside because I don't want to poison my child. So I start painting in the backyard and uh, I start painting on Arches oil paper at this time, which is this uh, surface that I absolutely love. I think they should start paying me because I've gotten so many people. I, I make all my students use it. I, I sort of like preach the gospel of Arches oil paper, but um, I started using it in part because I needed an easier way to store work because I make a ton of paintings and I had this tiny place and I have a studio anymore. So I was like, oh, I can just like do it on paper. But then I ended up really actually loving the surface itself. And so these paintings are actually really, really thick. It's hard to see on a computer screen, but they're they're very, very painterly. Um, this is 22 by 30. And I'm kind of getting interested in how space gets morphed a little bit, right? Like painting from observation and, um, you know, how, you know, things kind of go back into space a little bit differently in photos and our eyes work differently. And again, I'm, I'm really kind of like teaching myself a lot of this stuff because it wasn't, either I was a really bad student or I had bad teachers. I can't, it's probably like a combo of both. I shouldn't say I have bad teachers. I think I was just like, I wanted to do what I wanted to do in college. And so I probably wasn't listening on a lot of the days that they were teaching this stuff. But, um, so I feel like I'm kind of like relearning a lot of the stuff and trying to figure out how to do it. But, um, I was really happy with this piece, but this is, uh, Anyways, this is, this is a painting in my backyard, sort of similar here. And so I'm working in these like really sporadic hours from like 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. or like four to five, like any time that my son is asleep, I run outside and I start painting. Um, and also if you're painting outside from observation, the light's constantly changing. So there's all these things, it's very uncomfortable. So like, you know, I only have these like little moments to work. And at first it was really frustrating and it took a really long time to figure out how to get it even like remotely comfortable with that struggle. Now that struggle of painting from observation and dealing with all of those elements is what gets me most excited about painting. It took 10 years to get to that point. But at first it was a nightmare. I was used to being able to kind of sit in my studio and just like, you know, it's like watering this plant every day until it's like the perfect, beautiful flower that ever that the world can see. And that and this kind of painting I think is a little rougher and a little bit more like performative almost in a way. And so you kind of have to deal with what's there. And if the light changes and then that just has to sort of like, then it's gonna affect your painting in a certain way. Now to me, that's what makes them interesting. But at the time it drove me insane. So I've been doing this for a couple of years and uh, I started getting more interested in just the sort of history of observational painting and also intimist painting, which is kind of like an offshoot, I guess you could say, which is, you know, basically a French tradition from the 18th century. In my head, I'm not an art historian, but in my head, it, starts with Chardin, who's a painter that I really love. And then it kind of moves to like 
Bouillard and Bonnard, and in my opinion, like Howard Hodgkin in England, who I absolutely love. I think he makes brilliant paintings. And then the kind of like American strain of that is like Fairfield Porter and Jane Freelicker and Nell Blaine and Abby Dorrie. You know, there's there's all these kind of people that are, and it's this sort of lineage of painting that always runs kind of parallel to the other things that are happening in the art world, but it never really seems to go away. The more contemporary versions are like George Nick, who's my hero, and Lu Xiaodong, and um, who else is out there? I don't know. Um, uh, Susanna Coffey, people like that. So here's a here's a, a painting of uh, Fairfield Porters. It's always hard to see like paintings of your heroes because like they look so good. You know, <laughs> you show your paintings and then you see there, you're like, oh man, how did they do that? Anyway, I, I really love his paintings. And, um, you know, he was in love with Edward Viard who made this painting here. And Viard's a really interesting case in its own right. Really brilliant with these patterns that he's doing. You know, he would paint on um, cardboard, but you can see Porter's sort of love of him too in these, in these, um, curtains in the background that's like that's like a straight we are pattern like who knows if that was even there so it's just funny to see like how these artists kind of learn from each other we are this is a crazy painting but i love it it's so interesting to me and then here's avigdor rika who is this israeli painter uh who painted most of his life in paris actually but um unfortunately when you come across his name in most books all they say is that uh, he was friends with uh, the author, what's his name, who wrote Waiting for Godot. Anyway, I'm blanking on his name, but they were like really good pals, but Samuel Beckett. But I think uh, Avigdor Rika is this really brilliant painter and actually almost a better draftsman than anything. He's so good at drawing and you can see the thing that I've taken so much from him is just like, he's got this really beautiful sense of composition and almost like a Cartier-Bresson type thing. Like he's very good at composing the scene. And he's also someone who, um, most of his paintings from what I've read have, were painted in a day. And so I sort of always really like that sort of quick take on things. Um, intimism is also kind of about, you know, the sort of day-to-day -day relationships in an artist's life, you know, their family, their house, their living room, garage, cat, whatever. Uh, and, and choosing these things as subjects and, and considering them as, as, as deeply interesting, right? For as a subject for painting, because it shows life in its ordinary, in, in, in an ordinary way, just like anyone else's life, you know? And so I think the idea, at least for some of those older painters, maybe for me too, is that like when other artists or when other people, an audience sees that work and they see a painting of like your cat in your living room or something, they're like, oh, I have a cat in a living room too. I think by analogy, they're like, maybe my life is all, also interesting. Like if it was as, inter if it was interesting enough for we are to paint that, well then it's, you know, then maybe my life is great too. So that's kind of like the more theoretical side perhaps of observational painting, which doesn't cross my mind that much, but I think it is an interesting way of thinking about it. So anyway, we move out to the suburbs because that's what you do in San Francisco when you have kids because it's too expensive to live there. Uh, and um, at this point, I'm really starting to rely on my intuition to find the painting, which is something I'm gonna talk about a little bit more soon because that's something I'm super interested in now. And I don't really wanna put the idea before the painting, so to speak. So um, I think at this point, I'm getting a little bit better at observing. I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with how I want to apply the paint. Um, I'm finding good painters to look at, et cetera. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like, I, I think at this point, I, I read Van Gogh's letters to Theo for the first time, even though like every teacher in my life has told me to read it. I finally got around to it. And uh, what what's so good is that he talks so much about like, um, he talks about observation so much, but he never really says that he's getting better at painting. He always talks about how he's getting better at seeing. And I think that that's so true. And I talk about this so much with my painting one class, like even today, like I've been doing this roughly 10 years now. And um, I just, there's so much more color in the world around me now. Like you sort of learn how to see uh, color. And, you know, I, I have them do these projects and like I had them sort of like paint this white wall the other day, which is like a super mean thing to do to students. It's really hard. But, um, you know, there's like a broom in it. But I was like, oh, you know, like paint the light. How do you paint the light? Which is an almost impossible thing to do. And they did great. I have some really great painters in that class, but they, you know, it's hard for them. It's hard. I can't force them to see the sort of like subtle blue in the right hand corner next to this yellow next to this pink, you know, like they just they, they, they're not looking for yet because they don't know how and it takes a really long time anyway. So I think at this point, I'm starting to get a little bit better at that. I'm starting to paint on oil primed linen too, which if anyone's ever used that out there listening is like, you know, the Cadillac of oil paint surfaces. It's too expensive, but like it just holds the paint in this really beautiful way. It keeps the paint really vibrant. And I'm using these really stiff hog bristle brushes. So, cause I really like the look of paint. I mean, I think paint itself is really beautiful if that's not clear already. So, um, and you know, my paintings are just kind of reflecting these sort of moments in my life. Um, 
because when, I think when you start living that way, everything around you has potential now to be a painting. So it's like this kind of interesting way to walk through the world. And it changes the way you see everything. It keeps you preoccupied with something, right? It keeps you always kind of like wondering, you know, what's the next thing? Like, what's the next thing that's going to catch my eye? My wife gets really mad at me about this because we'll be out, family things, and she can see me just like staring at a trash can in a corner for like five minutes. And she's like, just stop, just stay with us, you know? But it's hard because everything all of a sudden looks, every, everything all of a sudden kind of has potential. Anyway, my friend Noah built this planner box for us that it was great. We're trying to do like, you know, suburb things. We live in the city for like 20 years. We're like, I guess this is what people in the suburbs do. So we built this planner box and uh, I'm, I've, I've always really liked the Bayo tapestry for no real reason other than I just think it's a really beautiful piece of artwork and history and my family's vaguely, you know, Western or um, yeah, Western European, I don't know. But, uh, but I like it. And so I started painting, you can see down here at the bottom, I'm starting to paint some of these figures from the Bayo tapestry around uh, this, this planner box. I, I ended up filling it, but Anyway, that's that painting. Um, all right, so this is, um, this painting's called Wally's Sick and our son had gotten really sick, which is why there's this orange sheet on the couch because he was throwing up on it all day. Um, and there was, uh, this was during the winter. So there's this really nice kind of like blue diffuse light coming through the window. And at the bottom, I start writing a little bit just about how <laughs> Wally felt sick. I, I kind of started writing this like literal narrative of what was going on. Um, and it was in this idea that I'd had for a little while, but I hadn't really done it much. And so um, anyway, so I start kind of just giving a, a general idea of what was happening in my life at that time. You know, one of the things you deal with when you're painting on the side is, like I was mentioning earlier, is just how uncomfortable it is. You know, like the light can be really bad and it changes and it's noisy and you're cramped and you can't see what you're doing because it's dark behind you or there's glare everywhere and you can't hide and there's people watching you and there's babies crying. And it becomes this whole thing but I think it makes the process a lot more intense. It makes the process feel a lot riskier. And at this point in my life, it's really hard for me to paint without a baby crying next to me. Like I have a hard time just sitting in like a quiet studio. I can't do it. Like I need sort of chaos around me. That's like my comfort zone now to paint like a like five-year-old needing my attention. And I'm like really in the zone. Otherwise I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I also think I need to have a, a way of painting where I'm just so, sort of always failing at it, which is how I feel about my work. <laughs> You know, you can't really get rid of that. It, it always has to be a gamble a little bit. And I went through phases in life where I was like gridding photos or like projecting them and tracing it. Um, and I, you know, at the time I loved those paintings and I, and I still think that there's like plenty of room to explore that kind of process. It can be, it can be amazing. But for my own work now, I think I realized that um, removing all the elements, uh, if I do that in my own work, it kind of like removes the elements that I find mo most interesting about my paintings, right? Like the goal is to get it exactly wrong, which I think was like a, I think Andy Warhol said that, somebody said that. Um, Michelle, sorry, I thought you were gonna say something. Yeah, the goal is to get it, is to get it exactly wrong. So in my opinion, what we look at when, when, when we look at artists that we like usually is, is we look at their faults to a certain extent, right? When I look at Rembrandt paintings, like when I look at the Night Watch, I always think everyone's arms in that painting are so short. No one believes me, but it's true. When you look at it again, just think about that. He always, had, and he's a brilliant draftsman, but you know, he has these weird like quirks about his drawing or like, you know, there's plenty of examples throughout history. And those are the things that end up defining the work. It's not so much that everything that they got right or else everything, everyone's paintings would have looked the same for the last thousand years. I painted this- uh, hey, Terry. This, uh, rather yeah. Sorry. Um, someone asks, uh, when there's text on, you know, when you've incorporated it into your paintings, can you read it? to us if you know what it says oh yeah on the on the one before no because I can't read it <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and uh, I don't remember what it said I, I mean it was basically about how my son got really really sick and we were nervous because we're new parents or something and then I was also reading the Protestant work ethic by Max Weber which is just a book I found interesting at the time and I think I write about that too. So like really nothing to do with each other, but it was just sort of more of like a stream of thought. And 10 paintings from now, when I start talking about these paper paintings, it's a lot like the writing is a lot clearer so you can read them then. And it's really like a similar idea. Cool, that's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, if you're if you're able to, just so folks can have just a little bit more context. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, unfortunately, like these are, even though this is 2019, it feels like I made it 10 years ago. So I don't remember. Painting years are like dog years, you know, it's like, it goes, it's, I don't know, it goes fast. <laughs> um, 
Okay, yeah, so here's a painting of my living room at the time. Um, I was supposed to paint, one of my friends was supposed to come over and I was gonna paint them, but they kept canceling. So I just put this um, fan. I was gonna, I don't know what my idea was having this person stare in the mirror. I don't know, maybe it was really melodramatic, but so I just put this fan there staring at itself in the mirror as a sort of a, a placement holder. Um, and then my wife ended up actually just falling asleep on the couch as I was painting. So it did end up being some kind of figure painting, um, you know, so. There's that, but here's a, a painting called uh, Wally's Height. And uh, what I try to do is there's this, see this big um, tape measure in the middle. So that was like exactly Wally's height. How do I explain it? So like in the painting, like the height of that tape measure is exactly Wally's height. So it's 20 inches exactly in that painting. And I got that idea. I, again, I wanted to paint Wally, but he was like, you know, whatever, he was two, so he's not gonna sit still. So I just decided to paint this tape measure instead. And uh, I got this idea because there's this great story I read about Henri Rousseau and Apollinaire that the, Henri Rousseau is that great kind of like, you know, naive French painter. And then Apollinaire was the poet and art critic, whatever. So Rousseau was gonna paint Apollinaire, but he was like untrained, which at the time I think meant more than it means today. So like you know, zero training from the academy. And so what he did was he had Apollinaire come to his studio and he put the canvas right next to Apollinaire's face and he measured like exactly his proportions of his face and like where his eyes were, which I think is like a really funny thing to do. Like you never learn that in like figure drawing or something like that, right? To like put your like newsprint right next to the model or something like that. So there's this really literal translation about how to describe life, which I thought was this kind of like actually really like interesting and smart thing to do and surprised that we don't do it more often. So this is my kind of like version of that, I guess you could say. So here's one of the larger paintings I had made at that time, still 2019. Like, I don't paint big that often. This is like 60 by 60. And it's called Melissa Does Laundry. Um, I'm not really good at poetic titles, but one of the inspirations for this painting was, uh, was The Fall of Icarus by Peter Bruegel. I'll show you here. Um, I don't know if you guys know this painting. I really like this painting. He was such a, Bruegel was such a moralist, you know, and it's hard to see in the slide, but on the bottom right, you can see Icarus kind of falling into the ocean. You see him like under that, under that ship. And in the foreground, you have these guys doing whatever, like plowing the fields, you know, kind of like day-to-day -day things. Um, and, and what I loved is this kind of like displaced action in this painting. I think it's really interesting. It foregrounds the day-to-day -day actions of life, but then it also shows kind of the potential for disaster and chaos. Um, and so this painting of my living room, Melissa's in the background doing laundry as the title suggests. But up front, there's this TV with, um, I believe that's Jacob Soboroff from MSNBC, uh, interviewing one of the agents at the southern border, which at the time, if I'm sure everyone remembers, was a really big deal in the news, right? The border wall, the stupid border wall, whatever. Um, and so, uh, um, and so I wanted to kind of, oh, shoot, sorry. So I wanted to kind of stress the relaxed comfort of home, right? The, the relaxed domesticity of home and the relative security that comes along with it. Um, in the sense of almost being insulated from the outside world, I kind of felt this way, like living in the suburbs too. But then I also have the screen jutting its way into that serenity, I guess, and protruding into the composition, carrying images of like the disaster of that time politically, in my opinion. And so it throws this contrast between the sort of soft domestic life and chaotic, and chaotic politics kind of into sharp relief, you know, as there's a way of producing tension, I think, in a, a quiet, tranquil setting as a backdrop for political chaos. You know, as a painter, for me, the subject of this painting was just that kitchen floor, right? I wanted to try to get, there was light coming from five different directions on that kitchen floor and how to, re, how to represent that with paint. I get really excited about things like that. But as kind of a person in the world, the subject was the tension between, you know, our private lives and our public lives. So it's a way of bring, bringing kind of like the outside world in a little bit and thinking about how the two affect one another. Um, and also thinking about how like social catastrophes, even, you know, like what happened yesterday, kind of interfere and shape our private lives. So it's strange that there's, you know, any number of potential catastrophic disasters globally happening essentially every day. And we still go about our lives caught up in our own affairs and upset that there's so much laundry to do. You know, you almost need to focus on these smaller things just to kind of get through it all. Um, you almost, you, you find yourself kind of more uh, or captivated uh, by tangible threats, I guess, like not getting the laundry done. Here's my studio assistant. He's a really good painter. Um, okay. <laughs> I just had to throw Wally into every talk that I do. Okay. Uh, here's Wally's room. I just like the way the light hit his floor. Sometimes I see something 
and it looks like a painting and then I know it's just going to become a painting eventually. Um, the older I've gotten, the longer I paint it, I try to just kind of trust that, which is something I'm gonna talk about here in a minute. I think it's kind of all you have sometimes. So anyway, we move again, this time even further out in the suburbs, we're just getting farther and farther away. And we actually, we bought a house out in Concord, which is like an okay place, kind of East, East Bay. Um, and it was a miracle that we could even do that. I don't know how that happened, but it, we moved in the day my wife uh, lost her job <laughs> because of COVID. So it was the most emotional, confusing day of my life. It was like this miracle and also like, oh, we can't pay for it. So that was a fun time. And I don't wanna go on about COVID because we all know how it's affected us. And I don't really wanna talk about that too much today. But one of the first paintings I made was this painting titled Melissa watching season six of Alone because she wants to move to the wilderness, which was true. We Terry, did. can I just like interrupt yeah. you a second and say like how much uh, my husband who's on the line right now too, we watched Alone so much through the pandemic. And so I totally <laughs> yeah. relate to this, like obviously as a scene, but also like as the title and just like, yeah, that was that was getting us through for a solid couple months in 2020. Yeah. Yeah, it was funny. Like we started watching it. We're like, oh, we must have just discovered this show. And then like every single person I talked to was like, did you watch Alone yesterday? It was yeah. Like, it was not a coincidence. We're all trying to learn skills to survive in the wilderness, you know? Totally. And we were so isolated. I think like there was such a uh, relationship there, you know, between the, the people that were out there alone and, and us yeah. in, our, in our homes. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I told that. Th those first months where looking back, it's been long enough now, I suppose, such a interesting times so yeah I mean I, I'm painting in the garage at this time and really we were like the show was on our tv all day long we'd like rewatch episodes even I don't know what the point of that is but anyway so um um, <clears throat> um so like, yeah I bought this saw because I thought I don't know how that's going to help me survive sorry I can't go back um and I never really used it I'm horrible with any power tools and it mostly just became a prop in all of my paintings but whatever the whole point was trying to make it seem like you know I was going to like learn how to build something so I thought it had something to do with my wife watching alone but really also like just compositionally I always if you haven't noticed like I like these kind of like pyramid compositions it's just like a natural thing like I like these kind of centered things where things start at the bottom and go all the way to the top I have no interesting reason why I like that. It just happens to be the case. My doctor, my eye doctor told me that like, I have an, I'm really bad in my left eye and I have an astigmatism. And I think it was something like, if you have an astigmatism, you tend to be more center oriented because you don't see the periphery as well. And then like, you, there's another eye condition where like people like things around, I, I don't know. It was sort of interesting, but um, whatever. I like centered compositions. Here's kind of a close up just because I think the paintings get so, they look tighter than they are. And it worries me because I don't like paintings looking like pictures. And it's really nice when some people tell me that they do, but I'm always kind of like, Ugh. they're like, they're, they're a lot more painterly than that. So hopefully you can see kind of like on this floor, uh, you know, they're pretty loose. I painted that floor like seven times because it's hard to get an oil stained cement floor look right. You know, the color is just like endless mud. So um, no, they're close up here. There's a little like Rembrandt tape to the wall. Um, this painting is called Cabin Fever. I'm going to speed up. I'm going to go through some of these a little quick because I've got more to get through and uh, I'm running out of time. So um, yeah, it's called Cabin Fever because, you know, there's that Nick Cave album and there's a song called Cabin Fever on it. And we had Cabin Fever because we were stuck inside. So um, yeah. Um, here's another one I made recently. Uh, this is again back when we were still in California. Um, I just want to make this painting kind of a similar thing where you have this really like generic I like paintings of flowers, like I said, I love the genres. I don't paint that much because I don't know how to do it in a way that ever feels interesting to me. So my my goal here was to sort of like paint this really generic sort of still life at the front, but then also paint like our electric car charger in the back and all this other garbage that maybe you wouldn't see in a traditional type still life setup and my cat in the bottom left and everything like that. Um, and so it's just kind of like, I sort of like this idea of having, it's again, kind of that Bruegel thing where there's this one little part that the painting is supposed to be about, but 90% of the painting is kind of something else. And so I like spending all of this time in these background paintings, this like sort of ugly garage wall, um, when really like that's not even necessarily what the audience is supposed to be looking at. Also, you can kind of see here too, my garage kind of split between like the artistic side of my life, like I painted it white, so paintings would look good next to it. And then just the sort of like day-to-day -day life of junk and paint in your garage. 
Um, oh, I thought I took this one out. Anyway, kind of a similar thing. This one I had to go back and forth between picture and observation. I think it's the only one. You can kind of tell it gets really tight in certain areas. And that's what happens when I paint from photos. Um, this painting was called uh, Melissa putting away her new comforter because it's too small for our bed. Again, very true. It was too small. So with these more narrative paintings, um, uh, you know, historically representational narrative paintings have generally been reserved for like heroic individuals, momentous occasions, we all know this. Uh, but these paintings, I think, are more about explaining why a particular story is worth telling. You know, I think I wanted to reverse it a bit and narrate routine existence by like, you know, big, like I was mentioning just before, sort of technically complicated paintings where nothing exceptional is happening. So, you, you know, I think some people, some artists look at life as marked by these big momentous occasions, like whatever schools you go to and like jobs you get, things like that. Or you can see life as kind of more of a series of small indistinct moments that accumulate after a while. And so I kind of tend to see it as the latter, obviously, and these paintings that sort of, um, uh, these paintings attend, uh, sorry, excuse me, I don't know what I wrote there. Anyway, so yeah, that's that's my thought there. I, I think these paintings are sort of like, um, not really about like the great moments and what we go through, but uh, but the smaller ones. Here's kind of a, um, a close up of it too. You can see they're like, they're rather thick and rather like there's really no inch uncovered. And part of that's just because I think trying to get things look looking right is really exciting. It's an endless struggle. I'm starting to use this, this is super like gearhead nerd paint talk, but I'm starting to use this medium made by Rublev, which is this company in Northern California called Velasquez Medium, which is essentially chalk dust suspended in oil. And it comes out almost like silly putty. And when you add it to your paint, if you're using thick enough brushes, it gives you this really like, I mean, like kind of like scratchy look. Like Velasquez is famous because Sorry, it's getting real oil paint heavy. His paint is really long, meaning that like when you dip a brush into it, it almost, it's ropey, some people call, so it feels like you've almost added glue into it. And part of that was like um, lead paint did that too, but because most people don't use lead white anymore, we have to find other ways to get that effect. So anyway, I was excited by that, using that in this painting. Um, here's a painting of a bunch of books of painters that I like. Another painting of uh, me, copying this other painting. So sometimes I really, this, this painting that's being um, projected onto this canvas is a painting by Resi van Lenkveld, who's this, I think she's Dutch, sort of abstract painting. I love her paintings. I think they're so beautiful. They're so interesting. And I just wish I could make them sometimes. And I want one in my house, but they're probably like, you know, $100,000. So I just made a little version of one and hung it in my bedroom. So I just projected it and copied it. So this is a, a painting of me doing that, I guess. Um, and then here, yeah, it's a painting of my easel. Again, really small. I'm actually starting to use lead, uh, Kremnitz white, which is lead white at this point, which I definitely don't recommend anyone using unless you're very, very careful, but it's amazing. In some ways I recommend everyone using it's the greatest paint ever. It's uh, it's really, it's, it's essentially poison. So you have to be really careful, but there's really no substitute for it. It's what almost every Western oil painter used that I know of until the 20th century because titanium hadn't been discovered yet. And so lead white just has this quality that I can't put my finger on it, but it just gives the paint this kind of texture and body in a way that like nothing else does. And it's very addicting and very expensive and I can't stop using it. It's really beautiful. It's hard to sort of explain in this painting, but it gives the painting just, if you can kind of see in the background, some of those books or like the things that are on the table, they have this like scratchy kind of like out of focus feel. And it's, that's really like the lead white and kind of what it does mixed with a, um, sort of a rough surface and a really rough paintbrush. Um, this is Michelle's background on her Zoom. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, yeah. And then this painting I made, I was having a show at the gallery in San Francisco and I was very nervous about it for a number of reasons that I'm not going to go into, but, um, or maybe for standard reasons that you have before you put on a big solo show at a new gallery. But I, I was making this painting and um, I, found out that I had really high blood pressure. I don't know if that's like, if it happened before or because of the painting, like whatever. Anyway, and it's kind of like this, more of like an older gallery where it's like the, the audience is a little bit different than what I'm used to. I spent a lot of time just showing galleries of where the audience is a little bit younger, kind of like hipper. And this gallery I think is sort of like a little bit older, sort of like just like a different sort of market, right? And um, I don't know, I got in my head way too much about it. And I was like, oh, I should make something pretty, which is like the worst inclination in the world for any artist, don't ever do that. So I started to make this painting and uh, whatever, I, I sort of liked something about it. 
uh, painting these things on the floor. It's still kind of like ugly and dirty in a way that I like, but there's some pretty things in it. And then I put this um, heart monitor in it <laughs> just because I felt so I called the painting blood like high blood pressure or something I can't remember what I titled it but um because yeah it was just like stressing out so this whole painting was just like a note to myself about like don't worry about it so much um Valentine's Day don't read into that too much it's a painting outside and then okay finally part two I'm running late huh? Michelle how much time do I have uh, maybe a couple minutes, um, if we want to do like a official Q and A at the end. Oh, okay. I'll do that. Sure. Okay. So this is called the drift. So this is a series that I've started, uh, two years ago during right before the pandemic started. Um, and I started painting on artist oil paper. They're all 12 by 16. And again, I started just painting like anything that's around me. Um, uh, I, I had read this book. I, you know, I'm going to skip that. Okay. So I, uh, <clears throat> what I tried to do with this series, I didn't even know it was going to be a series because I didn't really work that way, but I tried to uh, just wake up and have zero idea what I was going to do that day when it came to painting and just paint the very first thing that came to mind. And I did this almost every day for months. I made over 50 of them. It didn't take me very long. So, um, and then what I would do is I would write at the bottom and I would write, at first I didn't really know what to write. I'm awful at writing. I've, I have no business being a writer whatsoever. Um, but I decided instead of trying to make it interesting or poetic, which is something that like bugs me sometimes about painters, they like confuse what their art is, you know, um, is that I, uh, I just decided to write like exactly what was happening. I felt like if my paintings were going to be as like sort of documentary-ish and straightforward and prosaic, then uh, I would make the writing the same. So I would just kind of like, I would make the painting. I never worked on them for more than one day. They usually took like two or three hours. Uh, and then I would just put it down, write the date and write down literally the first things that came to my mind. And to be honest, I actually, I really liked how they were coming out from the beginning. I thought the the formula, the format of the paintings is kind of like box that floats above and then the writing underneath very old graphic style. I, I buy a lot of show posters, either from like Goodwill or online or stuff like that. I like kind of, you can all see them back here. I got this good, anyway. Um, so I buy a lot of show posters and they're always that kind of format where it's like painting and then like, you know, Museum of Modern Art, whatever. And I always really like that kind of like very simple design. I think that's partly where it came from. Um, and I've always really loved, um, uh, text and image together. I think in part because when I was in college, all my professors were like, don't ever write on your paintings. It's a different language, it's just visual always. And so, you know, like if you're a student, you do exactly the opposite of what you want your professors want you to do. So I think that was always kind of in the back of my mind too. Um, and I think also like sometimes the, the writing reflects what's in the painting, but a lot of time it doesn't. And that wasn't really what I was interested in. I didn't want to explain the painting because there's really nothing to explain anyway. Um, and so I would just kind of write whatever was happening in my life. Um, this is actually one of my favorite ones that I made, but this is made right after my birthday, which is why we had those balloons. And it was 40 and it was depressing because we couldn't have anyone over. I'm sure a lot of people went through that. I'm not the only one. Everyone went through that for the last two years, you know? Uh, and it sucks. So whatever, I got a couple of balloons, that was fine. Um, and I made this painting. Uh, and so I, yeah, I made a bunch of these. I love them. I had this huge show and I show them as a kind of a big grid because I think they're more, some are better than others, of course, that's not really the point, but I think they look good. They're sort of meant to be seen as a group, as this kind of serial style of painting. Um, I think some stand on their own, I think some don't. And, and the nice thing is I would bring them everywhere I went. My wife is from Visalia, which is this kind of like farm, central California town. So like, and I just like go and paint out. So like anywhere I would go, I would just like bring all my stuff with me and paint wherever I was. And so again, this is almost like a, almost like a pure distillation, I think, of, of, of what I was talking about earlier, where, um, uh, you know, just kind of letting paintings happen, right? Like letting, like not trying to set up things too much, not trying to get too involved with that, uh, and just trying to, and just trying to let something happen and let things be as they are and see if you can make something interesting of it. I read a lot of Charles Hawthorne, people like that who talk about that, who said, pick a subject that isn't really much until you make it something with paint. And that, that type of line is always kind of in my head as I'm making something. Here's Wally's room. So I'm going through these, I know. Here's a little bird's nest <laughs> in our outside. <laughs> um, so yeah, just really trying to respond to the world around me. Okay, 
Um, and I think I knew all of this eight years ago in Paris, of course, when I tried it for the first time, I just didn't really know how to articulate it, how to really like what observational painting really meant. But I think after doing it for this long, I know that the content and the meaning of the work is found in the experience of painting, less so in the outcome. And I think it forces you to look at the world in a much more interesting way. I mean, it's interesting when everything around you is, is paint. So um, here's what I've made in the last couple of months. These are all paintings of Utah. Um, I don't know anything about Utah. I've never been here before I moved here. I have no connection with this land whatsoever. So it's really hard for me to find something to paint lately. Um, and so I've been painting a lot of the painting studios that I teach in because at least that feels kind of like home to me. It's comforting. Um, these are bigger. These are 22 by 30, but again, on Arches oil paper, but with the same format and the writing underneath. Um, and, you know, any subject is always available to me because, you know, I kind of want to paint everything in the world. That's exciting to me. So here's just some last ones. These are the last couple of paintings. Garage. And then I just want to get to this last one. And then I made this painting yesterday. And I just wanted to show it because it never ends. And I'm probably going to make a painting after this talk because I have some free time and my kids are at school. So, you know, I just think like the, the sort of painting being a part of your life where it's not the separate thing that you do, but it's incorporated with everything that you do is really interesting to me. Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs> thank you, Terry. Yeah. Oh my gosh, if I could bottle your energy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, it looks like we have um, uh, just one question in the chat so far. And then if anybody wants to ask anything else, if you want to put it in the chat, you're welcome to. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. We just have a few minutes left. Um, Gabe asks um, if uh, your approach has shifted how you remember. Um, has it altered uh, the detail that you retain when you reflect back on your memories? I'm sorry. Can you... I I was re can you say that one more time? That was a long, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, Gabe asks um, if your approach has shifted, how you remember things, and has it altered the detail, um, you know, that you retain when you reflect back on those memories? Um, I, I don't know. I don't really, has it, has my approach changed as I, like, about my memory of the paintings? I'm kind of confused, sorry. I don't really, <laughs> I don't know, if I, I don't know how to answer that question. I want to answer that question. I don't know. I don't really understand it, though. I think I think it's something about like you know you're obviously kind of you know responding to time as it's passing in kind of these incremental ways, and so you yeah. know kind of looking back on those moments that you've depicted, you know, has your experience of those past moments changed, you know, kind of based on the fact that you painted them. It's kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, kind of, I mean, I, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think so. I think more, I just sort of like, how, like I was talking about that one of my wife, you know, that my angry wife after making her stand for me. Um, sure, like I, I'm so happy I have that. I mean, I think I would always remember that time in my life, but that was a really like particular moment or like that kitchen that it was painted in, you know, like there, there's a lot like sort of visually that I would probably forget that would get kind of fuzzy. So in that sense, sure, I absolutely love having that paintings. I wish I had that one in Paris too, you know, it's kind of this like hinge moment in my painting life, right? Like everything kind of changed after that painting. And so sure, there, there are these kind of like markers that are nice to, to, to have. And I do think about that, but um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm, I'm not so sentimental about most of them. Most of them, are, I, I, it's more about the experience, but every once in a while, yeah, you get one that feels really like deeply really about you. And when other people like it, um, honestly, I'm really surprised. I'm like, oh, you do? <laughs> you know, like a painting of my garage, you really, you like that? Okay. But really, you know, cause like it was kind of more like for me the whole time. So it's always like a nice thing, but uh, yeah, anyway. Cool. Um, anybody else wanna ask questions and feel free to use your microphone if you want or drop it in the chat. Or if anybody wants to comment and say anything, there were a lot of like really fantastic, just kind of comments as we went along where people were just saying how much they, you know, really enjoyed your work and. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you wanna go through, you can. Cool. Um, I really just love like how saturated your colors are and just kind of like your attention to, everybody says attention to detail, but I think attention to like, like you were saying, seeing in your connection to your surroundings and like picking up on things that, you know, the average person probably wouldn't, um, yeah. you know? So I think that that's so, so cool and so beautiful to like kind of heighten the everyday object in this way. Yeah, I think like when, you know, when you obviously like it's a, it's a process that's not super uncommon. I mean, there's sort of like a community of artists, right? That do it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, when you read about that, it's often about that a lot. I think that comes, like, to me, that's more the kind of, like, art history side of it, like a trying, like a, a way of explaining, like, why is someone to do this? I think for me and a lot of art, the few artists that I know who are interested in this, a similar um, approach to painting, um, it's just kind of more like, it's, it's such a complicated thing. <laughs> like why you, why you would wanna look at something and paint it, why it might be interesting to you. And it's really hard to understand, but what I was trying to get at the end, and I think I was talking a mile a minute, so I probably didn't, but is that, um, yeah, it's, it's, if you can follow your intuition enough, like if you're walking through the world and you look at something and it looks interesting and it looks like a painting, like I know in my head, even if it takes me two weeks to get back to it, it's going to be one, right? So I used to like make all these drawings where I would like take pictures of things so I wouldn't forget that I wanted to paint that or I'd write it down to remember. And I don't really do any of that anymore. Now I feel like if something looks interesting enough, I'll remember it because I won't stop thinking about it until I just go paint it. And so I don't, I, I'm trying like, so I feel like so much of what I do is trying to get painting less and less stressful. All I want to do is love every single second of it, you know? And so like, what can you do to make your paintings, or you, the process of your paintings as enjoyable as possible? Because I think if you do it long enough, you realize it's, it's, it's the main benefit of it, right? Like the other things kind of come and go, you have a show, you sell a bunch of paintings, awesome, and then you don't for a while. Like all those things are kind of like this, right? They matter. But like, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, I don't know what you're doing you know, like get another business. Yeah, I totally agree with that. hundred um, percent. Just, um, you know, a couple more questions and then we'll call it. Um, Faith says, uh, what would be your favorite color to work with? Or I guess like, oh. what's your favorite color maybe in general? <laughs> it's like cadmium orange. I mean, obviously, right? No, yeah, cadmium orange. Uh, cadmium orange is the best. That's a weird answer. I should say none, they're all great, you know, but really no, cadmium orange is the best. Oh yeah. I use it for everything. I can't, I'm addicted to it. That's awesome. Lovely. Um, let's see. Megan says, do you imagine your own scenarios that you go and look for? Like imagining something specific in a kitchen? Oh, uh, not really. I, I think there one of me, you know, I didn't talk about this, maybe one of the other reasons I went down this path, I just, I'm not that imaginative. I, even a lot of stuff I read, like I read a bunch, but it's a lot of documentaries type stuff. You know, I, I, I don't know, I like a, I, I, I think there's enough in the world that's interesting me, interesting to me to try to focus on that I don't really need to add that much to it. And it seems like I still try because it's just an inclination that people have and it almost never works. Like the, I, Porter had that, famous quote it was like the more you like it isn't the exact quote but like the more you like curate a scene the more you destroy it you know it's like the point being like even if, if you have this table and there's like after breakfast is like this perfect thing but you move like one cup over this way to make the composition more interesting it's like it's over like you, you messed it up you know there is this kind of weird if you can just sort of like trust what 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 the world gives you to me I think it's always more interesting yeah that's fantastic I love it great response um, cool. Well, I think we kind of have to wrap things up. Um, but, uh, if you want to, um, just kind of run through the comments, if you, um, if you're up to it, Terry, and just kind of sure. see what other folks are, yeah, saying, but, um, just really lovely having you here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone for coming. Um, again, um, please check out archergallery.space. All of the, uh, talks are recorded and they are there. Um, should you want to uh, go back through this talk or any of the other talks that we've had over the last couple of years, um, they're there on archergallery.space. Um, and um, again, yeah, if you want to check out Archer Gallery in person, we do have options for that. So you can get in touch with me that way. Um, otherwise, we will see some of you um, hopefully next term at uh, future Clark Art Talks. Um, and I'm really excited to, um, to present those virtually again. Uh, into into June. So um, thanks again for everyone for coming and um, I will let you all go for the day. Take care. Thank, Bye. You. Thank you, Terry. Thanks. Thanks everybody.